Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders, politicians, each are one to one. I'm delighted to welcome Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Lucinda Franks. She's traveled into the past to retrieve and capture her father's life for her latest work, My Father's Secret War, a memoir, now out in paperback. And it's as gripping as any thriller. As a matter of fact, it is a thriller and a very real and intensely personal one. Welcome. Thank you, Cheryl. Lucinda, at the point where your book begins, your father does not look like the hero of any book. He had lost his job as a chemist at age 60, never worked again. Now he's widowed, living in a small junky house in Milford, Massachusetts, from which he's about to be evicted. He's a mess. Mm -hmm. So what was it about this guy that made you want to write a book about him? You know, Cheryl, when I first began with this search to find out who my father was, I couldn't have imagined, you know, a more monosyllabic, rather boring man being the center of a book. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about him. He, he and I were very, very close when I was a child. He was a child's dream. He uh, would assume different identities in different days to amuse me. At age five, he taught me how to shoot a pistol, and I almost shot my mother, who was coming out of the porch, because he lined up little dull pineapple cans around the porch, and I ended up shooting one, and the juice just spurted out. It was, it was glorious. When I was a teenager, he suddenly dropped me. He became as enigmatic and as remote as he was with all adults. We remained fairly estranged during my whole adult life. He came to see his grandkids. He would never let me come to see his apartment that we moved him into after my mother had died. And he said was all unpacked, all clean, clean as a whistle. And then I got this letter uh, that he was about to be evicted by his landlord saying the house was a health hazard and a fire hazard. <clears throat> I grabbed my six-year-old daughter, Amy, and made for Milford and began helping him clean out the cartons, or rather cleaning out the cartons and him sitting and just watching. And uh, I came across in my mother's Red Cross files a little box. And in the box was a silk map uh, foreign coins, little negatives of uh, uh, aircraft installations, strange, a lot of strange things. And then under that, I pulled out a Nazi cap and an iron cross. Uh, and this is what started me on the search for the mystery that my father had always been. You probably thought, oh my God, my father was a war criminal or I, something. I did, <laughs> I did. At first I thought, oh my God, the, the, the secret, the big secret is that he was a Nazi. And then I thought, well, I found it in my mother's things. Maybe my mother had an affair with a Nazi. Uh, but I quickly dismissed this because my father was very sensitive to the persecution of the Jewish people. In fact, he had I had just heard that he had been with some friends in a restaurant. He was 75 years old at the time. A young fellow behind him was making virulent anti-Semitic remarks. My father suddenly flew through the air, decked the man, and put his thumb into the carotid artery, trying to kill him. My father was a perfect gentleman. He'd never raised his fist to anybody. Three men got him off, the, the fellow. His best friend took him home, and he broke down, and he said, these remarks brought up the Holocaust camp that he had liberated mm -hmm. as a secret agent, um, you know, years and years and years ago, which had haunted him all right, his life. Right, right. So as a result of finding these memorabilia, and you found guns as well, didn't you? Well, I, well that was when I was 11, 11 years old, uh, and I was hiding my diary under my mattress, and I pulled out a Colt 45, and I looked at it, and I said, Daddy. He was the only one that could have hid that there. I went around the house. I found a Browning automatic behind the Brillo pads, other guns, every place. And when I confronted him, finally, he said, you'll never know what it's like to try to protect your family. And I thought he was a paranoid delusional. Mm -hmm. And so I became even more alienated from him. 
When I found out all the secrets, all the things that he had done during World War II, I think I would have had guns in my house also. Mm -hmm. Now, you tried to ask him about these things, I mean, over and over again, you know, about his years in the, in the military, but you only got cryptic answers. Right. Um, so how did you begin your own search into your father's past, and where did it start to take you? Uh, he had taken an oath of silence. Uh, he still thought that oath of, oath of silence was absolutely ironclad. He was in a generation where honor, commitment, duty was the main thing. So I had to use all my reporter strategies to tease things out of him. And one thing was to know more about your subject than the subject knows about him or herself. So I read up every spy memoir, every every OSS book I studied. I found out from his military records where he was at certain times and put that together with operations. So I started to talk about operations and said, oh, I know you were there. And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, Dad, I, you know, I knew you did this. No, no, I didn't do that. I did this. You know, so I would get information out of him. And then I had to go to the National Archives. I had to go to the Naval Museums and try to find records that would confirm what he did. And it was like being blown from place to place because, you know, I couldn't find his name or the name of his unit. I would go back discouraged, thinking this was a total illusion. Then I would find that uh, some uh, war buddy of his had called me back after months and would confirm, oh, yeah, your father was an uh, uh, undercover. He was a deep undercover agent. Mm -hmm. So basically, that would start your, me again. Basically, all your father said was he was in an ordnance unit with the Navy, yes, which yes. Meant they looked after, wep right. after weapons, correct? Right. Uh, and, and, but that wasn't the whole story. So what did you find? Who did your, what did you find out about uh, the work your father did during the war? You know, who did he work for, actually? Well, he was one of those people that was tapped as a spy right away. He was a little boy from Illinois, but he had become a, tra a crack marksman by shooting woodchucks for farmers. He uh, loved chemistry, so he, you know, went on a vacant lot and he blew up uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, things, uh, innocent things, until the police told him to stop it, Tom, just go home. Right. He, he was a really brilliant man who could learn something. He had a photographic memory, uh, learn something, uh, learn an accent, learn a language in a weekend. So he had all the qualifications of spoke fluent German that he had taught himself and had gone to Germany several times to learn the lingo and the slang. And because and this was because all the good chemistry books were written in German. This is what ah. uh, made him do this. So he was a ta tapped in, in a into a special unit in the Department of Ordnance, which was a sensitive department because it, it dealt in new weaponry and in, you know, invented new weaponry. And then he was attached to naval intelligence, to the OSS, uh, even to the British SOE. He was kind of a troubleshooter. And then at one point, he settled into a role with the OSS uh, in the French resistance. Uh, at first, he was sent to just teach uh, new resistance members, butchers, bakers, you know, just ordinary people, how to shoot guns and how to, you know, ex make explosives and explode, uh, you know, vital installations. And then uh, the person that did the assassinations was assassinated. And they said, well, Tom's a crack marksman. And so he was tapped to do assassinations um, of several army officers. And then Including one of his buddies, right? Well, after he did the uh, the Nazi killings, uh, he was later, towards the end of the war, he, he, he had a, a best friend that had been an agent and a partner of his for a long time. And as the Americans moved in to Germany and the Russians moved in from the other side, there was great enmity between the two forces who were in a grab for weaponry, blueprints, um, all the things that the Nazis had left behind that were way ahead of what we had. Um, <clears throat> and he uh, uh, found out that this friend was a double agent. He had been selling secrets to the Russians. He had to recommend, again, duty over the heart he had to recommend that this agent be liquidated, and they said, you do it. And he had to shoot him in the back of the head uh, 
while they were walking. Do you, uh, do you know how many people your father all told had to assassinate? He told you he was, he said, I was an assassin. Do you know how yeah, many people? He never told me exactly how many, but I kind of figured out by some of the stories he told. Because at a certain point, Cheryl, he forgot that he was supposed to forget. Mm -hmm. And even though he was losing his short-term memory, his long-term memory remained crystal clear. And the, and the memories came tumbling out. The incidents, the anecdotes came tumbling out. Right. So I could kind of count them up. Right. And there was at least 10. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Uh, he was also um, there to liberate, as you said, a, uh, a concentration camp mm -hmm. in Germany, mm -hmm. right? And right. that had a big impact on him. Oh, absolutely. I think this is what broke him uh, because he had never seen anything like this before. Uh, he had a number of Jewish friends when he was growing up in Illinois. He had never heard the word anti-Semitism, uh, so to speak, and he just didn't understand. And he was whisked away as soon as he had examined every nook and cranny and made his handwritten report, told never to talk about it, never to uh, think about it, pretend it never happened, because at that point, the American forces were trying to suppress knowledge of the Holocaust camps because they didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. Eisenhower received my father's intelligence report along with a few others. He had not visited this camp, this first camp that was liberated by the Allies called Ordruf, and this report um, made him realize he had to go. Eisenhower. And he went. Yes. Right. Right. Yes. Right. Um, well, we're going to take a break right now, and I'll be back with more with Lucinda Franks, author of My Father's Secret War, a memoir, right after this message. Find out how a healthy lifestyle can help your child succeed. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy, and I'm talking with the writer Lucinda Franks. Her latest book, My Father's Secret War, a memoir, has just come out in a paperback version. Um, your father was all over the place. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was not uh, only there for the liberation of this concentration camp in Germany and not only teaching people of the, in the French resistance how to, mm -hmm. how to shoot, uh, but he was also in the Pacific, right? He served in the he Pacific. He started in the Pacific, and okay. I could never confirm that he was really uh, of, of an undercover agent, a real spy in the Pacific, and I never understood this because if he was going to be tapped, he should have been tapped right in the beginning. And uh, I interviewed one of his closest buddies, his closest buddies in the Pacific, uh, a man who said he never knew anything about my father being a spy. He doubted it was true. After I wrote the book, I was sitting at the dinner table, phone rang, here was the guy on the phone, and I said, hi, Jack, and he said, I read your book. And I said, oh, and he said, yeah wasn't a bad book, but you didn't get it right. Ah. And I said, what do you mean? He said, your father was a spy in the Pacific. And I said, Jack, I interviewed you three times. I asked you over and over, and you said no. And he said, I wasn't going to tell your father's secrets. And I said, well, did my father ask you to keep it a secret? He said, he didn't know. And I said, how did you know? And he said, I'm an insomniac, always have been, always will be. I saw him creep out of the tent, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, join a Marine scouting group, and they saw them bring back the uh, Japanese prisoners. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, no, he didn't do the rough stuff. He says, no, 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 he was the Japanese interrogator. Uh, okay. And I said, he spoke Japanese? And Jack said, yeah, he learned Japanese and he spoke enough to interrogate the, wow. the prisoners. Wow. So. Were, were some of the missions that your father was involved, was he, were they dangerous missions, some of them? Oh, definitely, definitely. I think the, uh, 
uh, the scouting for Japanese prisoners when they had, you know, when they were hidden up in the trees, hidden in, in, in the holes where they couldn't, the caves where right. they couldn't be seen, uh, was terribly dangerous. And he named some incidents in which they were all shot at. And he, you know, being a young uh, uh, and foolish man, ran up and, you know, just machine gunned the, the hole and wiped out the people, you know, instead of standing back and doing what he should have. Uh, Which missions affected, do you think, affected him most deeply? I think the assassination of his friend, the memories of what happened when up close he shot the back of his head, which you can only imagine. Right. Uh, the liberation of the Holocaust camp and the intelligence report he, he made. I shared a wall with him. And at night I used to hear, stop, stop, stop. And I would get out of bed, run into his room. He would be all twisted up in the covers, sweating, murmuring to himself. I didn't know what this was until much later, that he was haunted always by these ghosts. And, you know, with World War II soldiers who saw that kind of uh, combat and were made to do things like that, there was a post-traumatic stress syndrome that remained undiagnosed. I was going to ask you about that because we, by the time we got to Vietnam and certainly mm -hmm. now with, you know, with Desert Storm and with Iraq, we know about post-traumatic stress syndrome. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, do you think he had it? Oh, very definitely. This was why I think it was called the silent generation mm -hmm. because these soldiers, these trauma soldiers, many of them, came back to parades, jobs, the GI bills. The wives didn't want to know about what they had done. They just wanted to you start their... You didn't do therapy their... in those days. No, and they just wanted to resume their lives. Right. So it was driven underground, never talked about. Uh, and I think these, these people suffered... Uh, uh, silently. Uh, silently, and, and were, came back different men than they had gone into the war. And I actually confirmed this when I found a cache of letters my father had written my mother right in the beginning when he went into the Pacific. And it was like they were written by a different man. Mm -hmm. uh, they, the handwriting was curly and, and fresh, and he was full of, of joy of life and ambition. He carried a, a lizard named Oscar on his shoulder. And this was totally different and full of endearments from my mother totally different from the, the silent man that I knew who wrote, whose writing was stick figures, mm -hmm. not curly uh, uh, flourishes. Some of your father's experiences sounded a little James Bondsian, you know, mm -hmm. exploding ballpoint pens and the like. Did mm -hmm. he see them that way or? Oh, not at all. In fact, when he was, about a month before he died, he was still compass mentis. I said, Dad, I want to write a book about you because I didn't want to go forth and with this question of whether I should be doing this and it would be against his wishes. And he said, why would you want to write a book about me? And I said, because you did so much. He said, I didn't do anything more than any other uh, soldier. And uh, I, I, I thought you thought I was boring all your life, and I said, I don't think you're boring at all. What have you learned about the personality of people who are willing to take such risk? Uh, well, the first thing I've learned, really, is you cannot judge people by how they seem. That everyone has a story, everyone has a secret life, everyone is going through something that you don't know about. So the person that snaps at you um, you know, you look at as a person to be kind to, perhaps, rather than to, you know, shun. Uh, it, it's just taught me to look at people a different way. And I think that so many of these men sacrifice their lives for their country, not, you know, by dying physically, but by dying emotionally. Right. Now, you talk about how your relationship with your father changed from when you were a little girl to when you were a teenager. Mm -hmm. What have you concluded that was about? Oh, I, I think it was very definitely about the fact that when you became of age, you started asking questions. He didn't want people to get that close to him and, and that he would slip and he, you know, would somehow reveal uh, what he had been, break his oath of silence and break his protection 
of his family from knowing what he had been through and knowing that they may be in jeopardy by people that wanted to uh, uh, get revenge um, for the killings that he did. Did you think your mother knew about any of this stuff? Well, my father had more than one double life. And my mother and he could not relate after he came back to the, from the war a different person. They didn't know each other. Uh, they were estranged very early, living in the same house because you didn't get divorced then. And they were in their 20s at that they, point? In their, yeah, 20s to, to 30. And uh, my father took a mistress who was a poet who I believe now, although I hated her all my life. This is Pat. Pat. Um, until the end, uh, I think she saved his life because he could come to her and he could tell a little bit about what he had done. Just a little bit, just enough. And she, she understood. She, was a she is a poet. She understood him. And I used to throw away her spindly writing when I saw the, on the envelope her spindly writing because I didn't want anything to do with her. Uh, but now she came up from uh, the launch of my book a year ago mm -hmm. and insisted on ironing my dress. That is how wow. close we are. And they had a relationship for how many years? All, all my father's life from the time he came back from the war until he died. Wow. Wow. Why do you think he never married her just because divorce was not something that she did? Divor well, not only that, but he really didn't want to leave Penny and I. That's what uh, Pat said, is that he, he said, I just can't marry you because I can't leave uh, my kids. And through Pat, I learned, how, even though we were kind of estranged, I learned how much he loved me and how much he noticed me and knew when I was taking my asthma medicine in the middle of the night because he would stay up to see that I took it right, that, that he would know when I had a new boyfriend or a new dress and he would tell Pat about it. They would, he would come with secret photos he had taken of me. Uh, and it was just a, a complete revelation. Now, although your parents' marriage was difficult, once she was diagnosed with cancer, mm -hmm. your father tended her very devotedly yes. in the last few years of her life, yes. right? Yes. This is something that I never realized in my life, and that was that my father was an enormously good and honorable man. And he was with Pat at the time she got cancer. When she learned of it, uh, he came back. He said to Pat, I can't see you anymore. He came back and he single-handedly nursed my mother, cleaned the house, made the meals, took care of her, changed her colostomy, you know, did everything uh, for her until the day she died. How did writing this book affect you? Well, I missed a lot of years with my father. I figured I had no father for a lot of my life. And we had this very intense rapprochement and reconciliation at the end, but it was very short. It was only a few years before he, you know, went into dementia and then died. And writing this book uh, was a way of perpetuating that world that we had found together, of kind of recreating the years that we had lost. And so it's been, it's been the most wonderful um, writing experience I've ever had. It, it makes an argument for everybody trying to learn about who their parents really were. Right. I, I have gotten, of the hundreds of letters I've gotten and emails I've gotten, the, almost to a, a person, particularly with the young people or younger people, um, you know, they, they want to know how to make their parents talk. They have aged parents with all the frustrations and the boredoms that that brings, and they, they know that if they find out who their parents were as human beings, that, that this will make the, those last years much, much richer. You mean they want to know how to get their parents to talk to them yes, about ab themselves? Yes, about themselves. And they've never looked at their parents as human beings. And what would beings. you tell them? Well, I tell them, you know, first to try to find out something. Go in the attic, look at the letters, the old papers, and start talking about, tell me the time when you went to China 
and got lost in the bazaar or something right. to that effect. And you catch them sort of unawares and yes, they may, exactly. they may start and talking makes to you. Them. And as you get older, I found that I've gotten a lot of letters from veterans of World War II who said, I want to talk now. I'm mm -hmm. ready to talk now. And so they, they are ready to talk at a certain point. It's just that they don't know that you have any interest right. in them. Right. Well, it's a fascinating story. And I think a lot of people will find it, will find it so. I'm sorry, but we're out of time. My thanks to Lucinda Franks for joining me. My Father's Secret War, a memoir, is just out in the paperback version for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy.